Morning, everybody. Uh, I think because I'm a bad person, I was too late this morning to get my slides here. So uh, apologies for me oversleeping. Uh, we are carrying on our series in Acts today. Uh, and we're looking at Acts chapter 4. Uh, and it's just a few short verses. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. And we're looking at the theme of possessions. Oh, look at that. Oh, amazing. Oh, I'd love a clicky thing. Thanks, Chris. How can you say no to an offer like that? Okay. Oh, amazing. Right, there we go. So, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Okay, there we go. We've got a nice little snapshot there of how the apostles, the early church, um, were living in the sort of first days after uh, Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. So they're trying to figure out how to make their way in the world, and this is a little picture of kind of how they were uh, living their lives together. And I guess my first question is, um, are we sure that this is actually an example for us to follow? After all, this is written by Luke. Luke's writing as a sort of historian. He's given a history of the early church and um, the things that happened to them. This might just be, it's only a few short verses, it might just be an incidental thing about the way that they happen to be living their life. You know, it might be like, I really want to learn how to play guitar like Jimi Hendrix. I go and read a biography of Jimi Hendrix. I found out that one day he walked out of his house and got in his car and drove somewhere. And maybe I'm like, okay. All I've got to do every day is leave my house, walk to my car, get in it and drive somewhere, and soon I'll be playing guitar just like Jimi Hendrix. That might not actually be the key detail in Acts. It might just be a thing that happened to happen, and we're all getting hit up about five little verses here. Um, but actually, you'll be surprised to learn, because otherwise I'd just sit down and we could finish right there. I don't think that it's just a coincidental happening. I think this is uh, a really significant part of the early church's response to Jesus and wanting to live out this uh, new life, trying to fo follow in the footsteps of Jesus, trying to be more Christ-like, trying to live in the kingdom of heaven uh, on earth here and now. So the reason I say that, and I don't think this is a coincidence that this is what happened, um, this is the start of Acts. So what's happening here, as I say, is these disciples, they've been following Jesus around for years. They've been trying to work out if he really is who he says he is. And then they have this roller coaster of they see him uh, getting crucified. And maybe they think then that it's all over. And then they see this incredible mind-blowing thing of his resurrection. And they realize it's not all over. Actually, it's all true. And that this is uh, a huge world-changing deal. And they're all excited and ready to go and live uh, in this new world following the resurrected Jesus. And then Jesus disappears. And he leaves the earth and suddenly they're left to their own devices and they're sort of trying to figure out how to make their way in this strange new world. And then you get the um, coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost when it falls like fire on their heads. And, and it's this kind of, um, the start of Acts is really exciting because it's all this high intensity um, kind of frantic action of people trying to figure out I, I've just seen this thing that completely changes everything about life, the universe, and everything. What do I do with that? And so all the early chapters of Acts are them trying to work out a response to that question. In a way, the whole rest of the Bible is people trying to work out a response to that question. Uh, and I think you see a very um, telling... Uh, consistent theme in these chapters of Acts 
um, which is in line, unsurprisingly, with the teachings of Jesus. So I think you see the disciples um, living a life that is being given away. That's kind of my best summary for it. So let's not forget, these are the people who um, have been following the teachings of Jesus. That's what they've been holding dear to. So Jesus who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus who said, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. Uh, Jesus who said... Uh, look at this poor widow. She has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live, in, live on. Jesus, who said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, who said and showed, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So they've been trying to figure out how to um, live like Jesus, how to follow him, how to walk in this kingdom that he's been teaching them about. And they've been hearing for years and years all this stuff about give your life away. Life is not for keeping. Life is for losing, for giving up to others, for uh, using to serve, not to be served. And you see this all through Acts, that there's this, right from the start, there's this kind of... Um, radical self-giving, giving oneself away. So the first thing that happens when the tongues of fire fall down is that they suddenly can all speak in all these different languages and they start proclaiming the word to, to everybody who's around. It's a very sort of, you know, give it away kind of gesture. And, and so many of these chapters have that same sense of like they've been filled up and now they're, they're trying to give this life away. And that should be no surprise because... Jesus is the person they're following, and that's what he's been teaching and showing for years and years and years. And so this short little bit of how they're spending their life together, I think, should come as no surprise, because it's a continuation of the same idea. They're giving away everything that they have to one another. They're, they're giving up their life. They're not trying to keep hold of their stuff for themselves. They're trying to give it away uh, to those in need, to one another. They're not clinging on to things. They're giving them with an open hand. Is everybody with me on that? So I don't think it's an accident. I think it is an example um, for us to follow. Uh, I think it's not just because of the words that Jesus said. I think it's because of the power of what Jesus has done as well that enables them to do this. Uh, I think seeing uh, somebody brought back to life, seeing somebody resurrected, drastically changes how you understand death and suddenly your life doesn't feel so much like something you have to cling on to because what else is there suddenly you realize that you are free to give your life away in in service and uh, in in generosity to others um, because there's a there's a bigger reality than just uh getting as much stuff as you can for yourself in the however many years you might have on this earth. Uh, I think seeing the way that Jesus was crucified by the people with power and then how he overcomes that power in this totally unexpected way gives you a new outlook on what it means to have power and suddenly you see this radical power in surrender uh, and in grace and in mercy and in forgiveness um, you see that made really real and visible and suddenly you don't feel like you have to accumulate more power and swords than the Romans so you can overthrow them. You realize that there is a, there's a different power in self-sacrifice and surrender and forgiveness and mercy. So I think both in Jesus' words and in what they've seen and in the filling of the Holy Spirit, the disciples are able to live this life of radical Christ-likeness, of giving one's life away in service. Um, and I guess, yeah, that's something that we want to um, emulate. That's something that we want to try and do as well, because we're in the same situation. 
If we also are claiming that we want to live more like Jesus, to follow his teachings, to live in the reality that he describes, uh, then we're in the same situation as those disciples. Um, and we are called to give our lives away, not cling on to them for ourselves. Uh, and so I think it's not only an example for us to follow, but I think it's an example for us as the church to set. Um, I think it would be a really powerful example for us to set because I think it's a thing that the world needs to hear at the moment. I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the contrast between that Christ-likeness that you see in the disciples here uh, and a consumerist mindset. Uh, that's going to be my, my big word. <laughs> Try and keep them to a minimum, but we'll go with consumerist. Uh, we could talk all day about this, but a consumerist mindset is, is what it sounds like. It's about consuming as much as possible, about acquiring as much stuff for myself, about grasping hold of things, about bringing things in so that I've got them and other people haven't, so that I can build up as much stuff for me as I can. Um, and I think that this, this radical contrast between the Christ-like self-giving and the consumerist self-accumulating, taking, getting, um, is a really, really, really powerful thing, especially for the world right now. The world right now is locked in a consumerist mindset that is all about getting as much stuff as you can for yourself, and it is disastrous. So many of the problems that are confronting people right here and now, the things that they are feeling as deep anxieties like we were talking about earlier, deep issues with the world, are because of a consumerist mindset, of an outlook of getting as much as you can so that they don't have it and building up stuff for ourselves and keeping hold of it. Um, that goes for everything from the way that wealth works in the entire world. We've got this wild system where a huge amount of the world's wealth is with 1% of the population and while huge swathes of the world's population have are in desperate poverty and not only is that unfair in itself it creates these systematic injustices that give more power to the tiny percentage of people who've got the stuff and take it away from the vast majority of people who don't have the stuff and that creates all kinds of ongoing injustices and problems and cruelties and it puts more power with the people who've already got the power and it takes it away from the people who already don't have it and it's because it's allowed to happen because of this consumerist mindset that says that's you're right, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to try and get in that 1% for yourself and claw your way out of being in the 99%. That makes it okay for some people to have like extravagant, vastly, grotesquely, unnecessarily more than anybody could ever need or want and more than anybody else could ever get or has. That's sort of a consumerist mindset. And we've got, we mentioned it earlier as well, so much as a like we're in a climate emergency that we've got about five years to drastically get carbon emissions down or we're going to be seriously we're going to be running out of planet to live on and that's because of a consumerist mindset in large part if we all lived like the average consumer in america who are in that top you know they're not all in the one percent but they're all up in the wealthy end globally, if we all lived like an average person in America, we'd need five Earths to sustain it. The amount of stuff it takes up to have that kind of lifestyle, we'd burn through five worlds. We only get away with it at the moment, and we're not even getting away with it because there are so many people who have nothing. But it's this consumer mindset that says you're allowed to, you're supposed to, you're meant to get as much stuff as you can for yourself. We're literally running out of resources to be able to do that. And there's people marching in the streets to protest against all the impacts this is having because we are literally consuming with our consumption the ground on which we stand and it's running out because of this consumerist mindset. I was looking for some other stats around this. How many things, this one really surprised me, I suppose. How many things do you think there are in an average American household? How many, how many objects, items? Any, any guesses? Give me a number. 
120? 800? Thousands? So the stat that I saw said there's 300,000 items in the average American home. I don't know, maybe they're counting like every grain of rice in the bag of rice in the cupboard, I don't know. But it, it is, it's frightening how much we've slipped into this mindset of getting as much stuff as we can. We don't even notice it's happening and we're literally consuming uh, the, the ground on which we stand. This, you, you know, we could talk about this all day. There's statistics um, up to your eyeballs for this stuff. 50 million tons of electrical waste get thrown away every single year. And it's, uh, it's waste. It's stuff that we don't need. So a, a huge amount of food waste we go through every year. Food that we buy and then just chuck away because we decide we don't need it. Because the world is locked in this consumerist mindset that says, if you can get some more, you go get it. If you can have some more, you have it. If you've got a problem that needs solving, you buy something to fix it. And it's disastrous. Consumerist mindset uh, is disastrous for justice, and it's disastrous for the planet, and it's disastrous for just people's character. And so the church should be a really powerful example to set. Christ-likeness is an amazing antidote to consumerism, as we see here in the disciples and the way that they shared everything they had. That is like the opposite of a consumerist mindset. Instead of saying, I've got a field and I'm going to hold on to it until its value matures and then I can invest it in something else and then that will be worth even more, they sell a field and they use it to help those who are in need. And even if we're not looking at the specifics of what you do with the distribution of wealth, the Christ-like mindset of my life has, is here for me to give away in service to others. I don't need to cling on to things for myself. I don't need to get more stuff for me. I look to serve and to bless and to give. It's a radical counter to consumerism. But I think sometimes, if we're honest, not only do we... We should have been setting this example for decades, for millennia. People should be looking at the church and seeing this self-giving Christ-likeness. But sometimes I think they look and they see the same consumerism. And it's really dangerous when we end up getting sucked into the same consumerist mindset in church as we see in the world. And I don't, I don't just mean about like, I don't know, we buy too many Bibles and then we have to throw some of them away. Or, you know, it's not just about the accumulation of stuff, it's about that outlook. That outlook that says, I need to buy things to fix me. I need to acquire stuff to be okay. I need to get more so that other people don't have it. All of that stuff in the consumerist mindset is really toxic and it does sneak into the church in different ways. Um, every time we paint a picture of like, you just need to do this, this and this and then everything will be okay and happy and rosy. That's a consumerist mindset because it's the same basis on which like a perfume advert <laughs> works. It says you've got this problem, your life is not as great as it could be because of this and this and this. If you just buy this perfume, if you just get this new moisturizing shave gel, if you just get this new digital reversible wig, <laughs> whatever it is, <laughs> like if you just get this thing, then those issues that you've got will go away, is solving things by consumption. And sometimes we fall into the same mindset. If you just consume my kind of church instead of their kind of church, then your problems will go away. If you just do this, this, and this, then everything will be happy and rosy and peachy. It's a consumerist mindset, not the radical Christ-likeness that says you have to take up your cross daily and follow me and lose your life in service of others. Sometimes we see the consumerist mindset in the desire to hang on to power. And this is embarrassing. I feel like I'm always going on about the same things. We did a session in Sunday school once, and I said, we've all been asked to talk about our, our particular area of expertise. What do you think my one is? And uh, somebody said, talking. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty good. And then somebody said, 
Trump. <laughs> so they know that I keep going on about the same thing. But genuinely, the, the, you saw this the other day, Trump saying that Christianity has been doing so well because they've been getting so much stuff under his premiership. His idea of Christianity doing well is that we are able to accumulate power over against other people. Oh, let's take the fight on Christmas back. You're not allowed to say happy holidays anymore. We're going to win that fight. We're going to squash all the other people from their religious freedom and make sure ours is bigger than theirs. Anything that says, I need to squash you down and build myself up. I need to accumulate power. I need to cling on to the money and the politicians and the rules that make things more comfortable for me and less comfortable for you is a consumerist mindset about taking, not about giving. It's about consuming and acquiring, not about that Christ-like self-giving and sacrifice uh, and... Uh, seeking to give our lives in service. So I think we should be the example to set, but too often we fall into the consumerism rather than the Christ-likeness. And then I just want to finish by saying, okay, well, that's all fine and good, Ben. That sounds nice. I agree. I'd like to be more Christ-like and less consumerist. But what do I actually do right now? Like... How do I make this happen? Uh, and this is, this is where I found this talk tricky. <laughs> um, because, so if I'm honest, the thing that jumps out to me when I read this passage uh, is this little bit here, where it says, from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them. Because I think, that sounds so casual, doesn't it? It sounds like, you know, just occasionally, they mostly went around sort of having all the stuff that they had before, and then every now and then when they needed to sell their house, they did so, and yeah, they did a nice thing with it, isn't that great? I read this, I kind of want this to say, uh, the disciples shared everything they had. So immediately, you know, as soon as... Uh, they, as soon as Jesus ascended, uh, they all sat down and they, they got rid of absolutely everything they had ever owned. And they renounced even the notion of property. And they took off their clothes and they threw them on the ground. And they immediately uh, sold all their fields and all their houses. And we don't know where they slept or how they lived even three days with literally zero stuff. But they didn't have anything at all. That's kind of what I want it to say. Because... At least that is like clear and direct and obvious. Do you know what I mean? I want it to be like, yeah, consumerism is so bad. And here's the nice, easy answer. You just don't have any possessions ever. Isn't that great? What a radical way to live. But it doesn't say that. And Jesus didn't live like that. I'm sure Jesus had a hammer or a plane or something to help with his carpentry. So it's not as simple as just jettison all your possessions right now because possessions equals bad. That would be the sort of tidy, formulaic answer. But as so often in the Bible, we don't get a formula. Uh, we get, and the reason we don't get a formula is because a formula lets you escape the responsibility to have a change of heart. So if it just said, uh, you've got to be Christ-like and live your life in giving and service rather than getting and accumulating, so have no things. And the closer you are to having no things, the closer you are to being like Jesus. We wouldn't actually have to change our heart to do that. We would just have to change the stuff in our house. It might take quite a while to get rid of 300,000 things, but it would be, we'd have a clear goal. But actually, the call to Christ-likeness is always subtler than that because it's a change of heart, it's a change of character. And that makes sense, really, because that's what will change the world. Yes, we have to change our consumer habits, but most of all, we've got to change our consumer mindset. 
I mean, if you want to try and figure out, if you're feeling like, oh, I've got way too much stuff and I need to try and get rid of some stuff, how do I know which stuff to get rid of? You know, the Marie Kondo rule is not bad, actually, for cleaning out clutter in your house. Does this spark joy? If not, it can go. And that's not a bad rule for clearing through clutter. But it doesn't in itself get to the fundamental change of heart and character that Jesus calls for. And so the reason it's not as simple as just bin everything is because he wants a bigger um, change of stance from us. That consumerism gets to more than just our possessions, like I talked about. It gets to our desire for power. Uh, it gets to our desire to have control over others. It gets to our selfishness. It gets to our pride and our vanity. And those are the things that we're called to change. Um, as puts it in Joel, rend your heart and not your garments. I mean, def definitely stop rending your garments. Like, the fast fashion industry and the amount of clothes we throw away every year is scandalous, and that's a massively destructive thing in itself. But always, in the Bible, the, the big change that is looked for is in heart, is in outlook, is in character, is in stance. Because if we're going to be at home in the kingdom of heaven, that is what we need. When the kingdom of heaven is come in its fullness, if we're going to feel at home there, it's not going to be about whether or not we had any property or possessions. It's going to be about whether our heart is used to living in radical self-service and self-giving rather than getting and accumulating and acquiring. The reason I think it says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven is because to be rich, you have to keep making choices for yourself. To be rich, to actually have a load of stuff, you have to actively keep saying, I don't want anybody else to have this. I want to have it for me. And if you spend your life saying, I want to have this, I want to have it for me, then you're not going to feel at home in the kingdom of heaven because it operates on Christ-likeness, which is the opposite of consumerism. And so, I just come back to this verse over and over and over again. It sums up so much to me about what Christian life is all about. It sums up what we see from the disciples in this passage. Uh, it sums up how we should have that attitude. Yes, to our possessions. Yes, to our money. But to our power, to uh, everything that we have ownership of. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. That's exactly what the disciples do uh, in this short passage here. When they're trying to figure out their life together, they look to the interests of others ahead of themselves. It's exactly the same call for us today because we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to follow the same Christ, the same kingdom of heaven, trying to get ourselves into the same Christ-like attitude. So it doesn't have a neat, tidy go home right now this afternoon and get rid of this, this, this and this from your house because it's too much. It's a bigger call and a more difficult one to look at our hearts and say, if I'm really honest with myself, where am I living out of consumerism, out of getting something for me, out of acquiring and accumulating? And how do I rend that and turn it into that Christ-like living for others self-service, service, self-giving, service, self um, yeah, living, looking to the interests of the others. It's not easy. I don't have an easy answer, so I'm going to do the standard thing I do and don't have an easy answer and pray. <laughs>